if you lead a team or organizations, and chances are you're hitting the ceiling of complexity as daily operational demands suck all your time, leaving no space for strategic thinking and working on needle moving initiatives. And I think that is specifically true since the advent of COVID because everything has been turned upside down. People don't come into the office anymore. Uh, you've had to completely change how you organize teams and get your work done. Um, joining me today from, from France is Richard Medcalf. He's the founder of X Quadrant, an executive coach to some of the world's most impressive and successful CEOs and their teams. In this episode, Richard will share four key insights that help his clients make real transformation progress in the area and becoming champions of transformational change. So Richard, thank you very much for taking time to speak with me today here on Total Picture. I'm really uh, appreciate the fact that you reached out and were interested in doing this segment. So first of all, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into doing executive coaching. Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's great to be here. And uh, thanks for uh, thanks for making this happen. Um, yeah, so I always say, stop me if I, uh, if I bore you to death, because speaking about myself is my favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how did, I, how did I get into involved in this? I mean, there's answer that on a whole load of levels. I guess my life story in, in just a few um, bullet points is I grew up in the UK. I studied at Oxford. I joined a strategy consulting company focused on the tech and telecoms and media sector, uh, became partner there. During that time, I moved to France. It was meant to be for a year to help build out the office uh, in Paris. And as these things happen, I met, you know, met a nice French lady and uh, <laughs> lived happily ever after with her. So um, I've been here 20 years now. Um, and in most years, I spend a lot of my time, you know, either working internationally or here in France or spending my time on the Eurostar between Paris and London. But obviously, in the last 12 months, um, none of that's happened. In fact, we can get into that. But um, so I was partner in this strategy consulting company, moved to Cisco, uh, you know, big tech company, um, various roles there. But I think perhaps the interesting role was at the end, I, I was... Um, part of a team set up by Cisco's uh, CEO and um, global head of sales, really to, I like to describe it as fulfill rash commitments made in the executive suite with partners, right, and customers. So they'd get very excited about a topic with a, with a customer and they'd say, let's do something, let's do a strategic partnership together. Let's do something special in this and, you know, let's innovate. And we'd be basically get the phone call from the CEO to go in and turn that energy, that enthusiasm into something that actually create a meaningful amount of value on both sides. So that was where I really, um, really kind of wrestled through some of these questions of how do you influence and create impact where you have no hierarchical authority. There are you know, people who are in a different company from you. <laughs> and even within your own business, there's a massive transactional sales machine going on and you've got to get people right. to do things which are outside of the system outside of the process um that was all great and then a few years ago i kind of stepped back and, and, I, and looked thought a bit about what i wanted to do in the world and what i wanted to create and really the legacy i wanted to leave my grandchildren and great-grandchildren you know what stories would i be telling them at the end of my career and i think it was there that i really decided that what i love doing and what people were telling me i was good at was kind of clicking the maximize button on people, you know, the expanding mm -hmm. their impact, helping them, perhaps people who've already achieved an awful lot, you know, who are already flying at a high level. And yet for them, it's normal, right? People look at them and they're impressed, but for them, it's just what I do. And yet they, they, they kind of know, well, there's, there's another level still for me. There's, I can still 10X things. I can still go beyond this. And helping them figure through, figure out, well, I'm already succeeding at this high level, but how can I have a bigger impact in the world, a, positive, a bigger positive change, a bigger positive impact on my teams, on my organization? You know, what do, I, what do I need to change in this success formula that's already working? And that's what I get passionate about, to get people clear on their purpose, their strategy, and their leadership, and bring all of that together. Well, a lot of what we talked about in the intro to this, uh, to this conversation today is the fact that so many executives today are are dealing with operational tasks rather than strategic tasks. Mm -hmm. So over the last 12 months, how has that influenced what you do and how you work with your clients? Yeah, so I see it a lot of time. If, if, you're, in an, if you're an executive 
in um, in a in a company or even a manager, um, you know, you have so much on your plate. I like to describe it as you're managing infinity. You've got an infinite amount of emails potentially that's going to be coming in nonstop. You've got infinite people to meet on social media. You've got infinite of books you can read on Amazon, infinite videos you can watch on Netflix and YouTube. You know, we're managing infinity and it's coming in so much. And you're right, COVID's added an extra thing because uh, the downtime people have had has kind of gone away a lot because everyone's back to back on meetings uh, online. Um, we don't have the kind of social space as much as we used to. Um, and the pressure's on for many companies, right? There's a lot more uncertainty, even if companies are doing well, are we gonna be doing well next year when our customers start to dry up, you know, or whatever. So um, there's a lot of pressure on people and um, not a lot of relaxation time, not a lot of stepping back time. A lot of the team meetings, you know, the offsites where people would typically get a breather to think about what they're doing and how they're doing it. A lot of that's gone. And so a lot of people, I think, are really struggling. You know, it's they're, they're, they're just overloaded. They're doing a lot. And the thing is, for them, it almost seems just that's the way it is. Right. And right. and and. Um, uh, and yet when I speak to clients and, and you know, new clients are often, you know, as they're coming on board, um, we realize one of their key pain points is, you know, Richard, I spend too much time in the operational stuff. I'm not thinking strategically enough. I haven't got the time to think strategically and work strategically. And yet that's the number one metric, right? The difference between an incremental life and an exponential life is whether you have any margin in your life to invest in making it better next quarter, invest in creating bigger results in a year's time. If we don't do that, we're just on the hamster wheel. Right, right. But if we, if we find time, uh, then we can get on the flywheel and, and, it, and it becomes incredible. But how do you get from one to the other? And I think that's, that's the kind of a, a key shift that people need to make. You know, one of the things that has come up constantly over the last couple of months here in the United States is what's termed Zoom fatigue, because mm. everybody is, I mean, here we are yeah, doing this interview down. over Zoom, right? And everyone is, you know, spending their days on Zoom now. I, I was on an all-day conference yesterday, and it's exhausting. Mm. Is that kind of thing happening in Europe? Uh, are you talking mm. about Zoom fatigue there? And what are some strategies for you know, kind of stepping back and, and taking a break. So again, when you get into this Zoom fatigue thing, doing anything strategically is going to be extremely difficult. Yeah, I have a great question. So let me answer it, actually. Perhaps let me, let me answer it at the end, actually, if I can come back okay. to it. Because I think, I think I've got these four shifts that if you understand will help you kind of understand how to actually get out of zoom fatigue okay right? because if you like zoom it's one of these things that fills up our days these days or teams right in many companies whatever it is uh google meet these are you know it's one of the things our diaries are full of them now right, right. and you're right it, it crowds out time and um and so the, i guess the first shift that i'd suggest people need to make is actually and they're all a little bit counterintuitive, right? But the first one is stop trying to free up time. Most people are like, I need to free up some time so I can work on this strategic stuff. I need to like free up time. I need to like get rid of some of these Zoom meetings or whatever, right? Um, stop trying to free up time because um, nature abhors a vacuum. And so if you try and create space on your, on your calendar, it just gets sucked in by the next urgent thing, the next meeting request. So, um, instead, you need to focus on the higher value tasks. So let's imagine you have free time. Imagine you've got a day or a morning or an hour. What would be the best possible use of that time? What would really move the needle forward, right? What would be that critical conversation you need to have, that amazing relationship to build, um, or that initiative you know, that capability to build in the business uh, or that risk to deal with or that um, problem to fix, right? When you kind of focus in on those things, those high value tasks, they're going to make everything easier in the future. And you really start to think those are actually super important. Then suddenly 
it becomes easier to get rid of the other stuff because you know what you're doing it for. You know, it's putting the rocks into, into your diary first, if you like. So there's a story, one CEO I spoke to, um, he said he became an, a, a master of delegation uh, overnight. Most people struggle with delegating. Exactly. You know, and, was, and he said, I became a master overnight. And, and, and the secret was my wife became seriously ill. Wow. And, you know, in these days of COVID, you might, you know, that's pretty close to home for many people. Uh, he became seriously Ill. she became seriously ill he had to look after her so that was his higher value task right suddenly he had a very high value task it was clear and compelling right it was make sure that my wife is okay so that we have you know <laughs> a good future together right and she becomes well so suddenly delegation was was easy right it had to happen and so we need to kind of get ourselves into that mindset yeah and, and i i think that's absolutely true and and again you know, I, I hate to keep coming back to this whole thing around Zoom, but delegating tasks now has changed because you're not in an office together. You're not having in-person mm. meetings. You're doing everything over Zoom. It's actually easier in many ways, however, because you can do things like record what you're doing. You can share your screen. You can record the task right. as you're doing it, or you can use one of those video recording uh, apps. And then um, you've suddenly documented what you do without spending any extra time doing it. So um, I find that's actually a benefit. I often say to people, like, don't try to doc write out a manual to explain how you do this process. Just do record yourself doing the process and talk about it. Talk about the decisions you're having to make, the kind of thinking, ah, oh, this is a bit tricky, this thing here. You know, normally I do this, but because I can see that, you know, this, this data is like this, I'm going to make a different choice. So you can kind of explain your thinking as you're doing a process. Interesting. Without having to write out a big 20 page manual to try to cover all the eventualities. Yeah, I think, uh, Richard, a lot of what people have had to do is become far more proficient at doing video mm. conferences. You know, sure. everyone now is buying ring lights and microphones and uh, upgrading their cameras because, again, we're we're living on video, which is kind of a strange concept when when you think about it. And you know, what one of the things that I found fascinating about this whole thing is, you know, for years companies have said, "Oh no, you, you know, we can't do remote." work people have to come into the office we need that synergy we need to have those team meetings we need to have mm. everyone in the office and all of a sudden now people are more productive um, they're getting more things done they're happier they like their jobs better mm. because a lot of the stress is off since they're not commuting two three four hours yeah. a day to get to the office how has that impacted you know what's happening in Europe? Is it the same kind of phenomenon? Where yeah, yeah it's very. It is, sorry, I'm interrupting you. Yeah, it is very similar. I think there's a lot of. I mean, a lot of that's going on. I mean, what I found myself in my own business, I have two main activities. The first of which is kind of coaching very high level executives, um, often CEOs or business owners or founders, uh, sometimes other C level uh, leaders, um, and then I also work with teams, executive teams because often we have many teams who are basically bunches of high performers. They're not really high performing teams. You know, everyone's in their silos running their operations. They're not really coming together as, as, a, as a leadership team. And what I found is that the, the kind of leadership team stuff dried up overnight when COVID hit and everybody went online because it was like, well, we can't possibly have a team, you know, uh, a retreat now because we're all on video. You know, we can't possibly do any team development because we're all on video and we'll do it in six months when it's all back to normal and of course it never got back to normal uh and you know even if things are getting better in different parts of the world if you've got an international leadership team it's still impossible to bring them together um and so actually what i've seen is that recently people have gone okay this is the world we're living in um what can we do you know how do we actually make a virtual leadership retreat better than the real thing you know like what can we do differently online that mm -hmm. we you know so it's for me it's like the amazon effect you know when amazon launched everyone was like this is like an inferior bookstore you know <laughs> um that's what people thought it was like it's not as good as seeing the real books and touching them in the store 
And then you realize, oh, actually, online brings you benefits. You can search, you can get reviews, you can get you know recommendations. It's super convenient. Oh, actually, now you can look at the pages in the book, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So suddenly the online experience leapfrogged the physical experience in many dimensions. And what we're now seeing is that, you know, when you do it right, a, a virtual leadership retreat can be as powerful, or perhaps in different ways, as a physical one. I'm not denying people, of course, people want to get together in, rea in, in reality. They'll want to get together. But you're seeing that you can do a lot of things uh, and move the team forward, even well, in this situation. <clears throat> well, I want to sort of get back <laughs> back on track yeah, to what we were back. talking about, the, the, these four shifts that, that you yeah. mentioned. And your, the second shift is examine your beliefs first. Now, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so when most, so exactly. So thinking about productivity, freeing up time, uh, most people think, well, I need a productivity hack. You know, like I, I need to, I've got to find a better tool because I was shown the urgent, important matrix and it doesn't, you know, it still doesn't help me because I've still got too much stuff on my plate or whatever, right? So people are looking for a new tool or they're looking for a tip of how to organize their email or something. And again, those are useful but it's actually the way we're thinking about our role, our responsibilities, what's required of us, what's, what we need to do. It's all that mindset stuff, which is actually getting in our way. I'll give you an example. Uh, I was working with um, uh, a leader who admitted he was having a difficulty extracting himself from operations and delegating in some, in some areas. We explored, well, why is that the case? Well, you know, I, I really, I'm a perfectionist. I really want that high level of quality. And I'm just not sure my team are there yet. They're not going to deliver at that level of quality. And this is an important process that I'm responsible for. And so I kind of pushed him a bit and said, well, so what you're telling me is you're being the high performing janitor. You know, you like, you like washing the floor, you know, washing those floor tiles to this, perf you know, perfection, right? The absolutely shiny, you know, yellow tiles on the floor, whatever. That's the perfection, right? But in the meantime, you know, the, you know, the business is not being managed, right? There's nobody in the CEO chair or in the, he was actually a, a finance kind of guy. But, it, but the point was, yeah, you can create perfection at the wrong level of impact, right? So don't be the high performing janitor keeping this operational task for yourself, actually realize that it's much, you know, what, your, what the organization wants from you and what you really need to do to move to another level is to be happy that the floor is 80% cleaned, <laughs> right? And you focus your time on the next level task, right? The more transformational tasks. And, you know, the janitor will figure out how to clean the floor, if, you know, and, and, if there's a problem, he'll sort it out and everything else. So it's just one example, but that just kind of mental image. Oh yeah, I don't want to be the high-performing janitor, right? I want to be the, you know, I want to be the manager or the, you know, director. I don't want to be the high-performing janitor. And it, it just, it's a mindset shift that then allows, allowed him to go ahead and delegate. And I spoke to him, you know, um, like this week, and he said, you know, in the last three months, the way I see my leadership has totally changed. I mean, that was just one little mini, you know, micro part of the journey. But I just realized uh, what I'm here to do is different from what I thought I was here to do three months ago. And the tasks that are important to me are different. And it's when you have that shift, then the other tactics, they come automatically. You know, you can find them, you can Google them, you'll figure them out. But I it's think the that's really, Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I think you're absolutely right. As a lot of executives do obsess over the details as the old saying goes you know the devil is in the details right mm -hmm. you know so so to get out of doing the janitorial work and getting into the strategic work um is a mind shift mind, mindset shift yeah and for me again it's it's this idea of um i just get described it as opex versus capex um uh, perhaps it's, I'm perhaps I'm bleeding into the next in the next kind of shift here, uh, but it's relevant. Which is I talk about acceleration and not speed, right. right? So, so when you're in the details, you're often kind of you're trying to get the task done and you're trying to um, have all the data you need, right, to to make a decision or, or whatever move move forward. Um, but a lot of our tasks are what I call opex. In other words, they're repetitive, as in they might be super important, like closing a deal delivering a project, 
right? Doing the quarterly business review. All these things are what I call OPEX. They kind of keep you in the incremental, right? They keep the lights on. They're important, but they are, they repeat. There's always another client, always another thing, right? For me, strategy is what I call CapEx. It's an investment, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's I invest time now so that next week is better, so that next month is better, next year is better. And if you can, and, and if you can, so if you find a project that allows you to up level in some area, do something faster, get, take something off your plate, and create, create, create a capability, then you're playing this game of acceleration, right? Not speed. Speed is just saying, I'm going to do, do things faster and faster. I'm just going to like spend all hours of my day working on this new, all these projects that have come in. Acceleration is accepting that you might go slowly, a little bit slowly this week because you're building some systems and some processes. But then all the next projects that come along are going to be de done just that much more smoothly with less effort and less time. So it's this question of investing in the tools that are going to make your life easier. Yeah, and if, if you know, to the point of if people are just uh, in the speed lane at this point, the burnout is going to happen at yeah. some point, right? Yeah, exactly. That's what happens. There's only 24 hours in the day. And so if you decide that you're going to bet on speed, in other words, just solve problems fast, because you know how to do that, you're going to hit that that burnout. You're going to hit hours in the day, the seeding of complexity. If, however, you say, I'm going to free up a bit of time to work on these strategic upgrades, then over it will compound Right. And you'll, you know, you'll create this kind of exponential uh, curve. It happened to me in my own in my own life. Uh, I think um, when I was in consulting at the start of my career, you know, I was building Excel models like a lot of you know analysts. And um, but I took time. I didn't even realize I was doing it. I was just thinking strategically. I I I've, I built. I spent time kind of geeking out as people saw it, building my own Excel templates. Mm -hmm. You know, with with like re reusable building blocks and like little mini financial things built in and I, I built a little Excel toolbar, you know, this was 20, 30 years ago, which would allow me to format, you know, with key, special key commands would allow me to format things and like fly across these spreadsheets. Okay. And people at the time thought, well, Richard, you spent like two days doing that. Well, I've been busy on my project, you know, you're a loser, <laughs> right? <laughs> but, but suddenly I had, I had this infrastructure that I had developed that allowed me from then on to deliver models and you know well the charts were pre-built right so i was able to turn out really high quality output in a fraction of the time like half a day and not a week compared with my colleagues right. and so that time that margin that i created i could then invest in building client relationships you know taking on management roles in the company and that's why i think i've, I've progressed so fast because i was always looking at ways to do the hard work now and to build infrastructure mm -hmm. that helps me go forward. A colleague of mine, um, when I was at Cisco, talked about um, do it yourself, you know, home improvement. And he said, he said, I only do it once a year. So I go and buy a cheap hammer from, you know, the, the, the hardware store that falls apart, you know, a $1 hammer. It falls apart, but I've done my job for the year. It doesn't make any difference. But he said, if I was a carpenter, I would buy the, you know, the shock absorbent, you know, titanium cased, you know, super hammer that cost me $100, right? Because it's the tool of my trade and I would want the best hammer that's going to be totally reliable, that protects me and so forth, right? Because it's all of my trade. And therefore, Richard, as I'm an IT, you know, as I'm a knowledge worker, I'm going to have the best computer set up with the most recent computer and the best smartphone and a double size monitor and et cetera, because that's, you know, and I'm going to learn all the shortcuts because that's my hammer, right? That's my tool. Right. So again, he invested time and money to, and, and I, I had the same principle, but it really, that was a real shift for me. I was like, yeah, you're right. I need to invest in this IT stuff <laughs> because it's the tool of the trade, right? Yeah. And where I see people who don't know, who haven't optimized their email program and don't know the shortcut cuts, I'm like, <laughs> there's a real obvious low hanging fruit. You're in that email program for hours every day why don't you learn the thing that takes you one second to do it and not 10 seconds? Those, that one, that racks up very quickly. Um, 
it's a tiny micro example, but it's back to this idea of invest to accelerate. That's interesting. Just solve yeah. the problem now. So the, the fourth shift that you would like to talk about today and that I find really interesting is you call it work the room. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so this is really, um, you know, if you're an executive or a manager, um, then this is perhaps the key insight. You know, improving your productivity, focusing on strategic tasks. It's, it's actually a leadership issue um, and it's a, it's a personal behavior issue, right? It's a mindset issue. It's this inner work. It's the deep work. And it's a leadership issue because when you're, when you're in a leadership role, you're having to, in a company, you've got stakeholders all around you. You've got your team, you've got your boss, you've got colleagues, you've got investors, you've got customers, all these people with expectations upon you. Okay. And so you can't, it's really, really hard to shift what you do if you haven't renegotiated your agreements with those people. Simple example, let's say you've got your boss habit into the habit that whenever he emails you, you reply like, boom, uh, a minute later, right? Or whenever your chief marketing officer emails you, she knows she's going to get a, a reply from you, you know, within the hour. You've kind of trained these people and they're now relying on it. It's part of their business process. <laughs> it's like email Peter, we'll get a quick reply. I don't need to worry about it, right? So he's, and then suddenly if you, if you take two hours to reply, they're like panicking, what the hell's going on? I've got a, you know, <laughs> I've got a report to deliver. Where are you? So I might tell you, you know, obviously you need to batch your email. You need to not spend so much time in it. You need to do it in blocks. You need to have a day without any emails or whatever, whatever we might decide. You're not going to do it unless you've renegotiated those agreements with people and you've actually set out and you've had the hard conversation sometimes about how you want it to work. There's an example I can give you. Um, again, a, a client of mine, executive in a very large $3 billion, um, $3 billion um, tech services company and uh, on the C-suite. And uh, he said, Richard, I'm spending too much time in my email. I know I am. But I, I always want to be responsive to people. I want to like get back to them. I want to be a trustworthy and reliable colleague. I don't want to be the kind of jerk who doesn't reply to his emails and I have to be reminded 10 times. So I'm always trying to make sure that I'm on top of my emails and I've got a, you know, a, a clean inbox. But I know it's taking a lot of time. So I said to him, well, yeah, tell me, um, tell me like, what would your CEO like? No, actually, let me step back. What I actually said was, nothing I can tell you is going to is going to win against that idea that when you do your emails, you're being you're being tr trustworthy and reliable. If your mental model is trustworthy and reliable is doing my emails, then you're going to do your emails no matter what I tell you. It's your identity, because if I say don't do your emails because it's a good productivity tip. You'll say, yeah, but I'm going to, I don't want to be unreliable and untrustworthy. So you won't do it. It's just instinctively, you know, uh, subconsciously, you won't do it. But what would your CEO ask you? What, what, what for him does he want you to be doing? Well, he wants me to be running these transformational projects. Okay. What about your um, shareholders? Well, yeah, these transformational projects really need to happen if we're going to achieve our goals. And what about the employees of the company? Oh, well, yeah, the team needs these projects to happen because it's really going to modernize their experience and you know make them more effective okay so so it sounds to me that actually when you're bogged down in your emails dealing with all these requests coming in and not working on these transformational projects you're actually it's then that you're being untrustworthy and unreliable to all these stakeholders is that right oh yeah it is richard yeah heck you're right so trustworthy and reliable actually means carving out significant time to really drive forward these big projects. Yeah. Okay. So again, that's a mindset shift. He didn't need the email tips then because he suddenly had very clear about what success was, was right? But then, of course, the next step for him was, okay, well, who, who needs to know about this? Well, the CEO needs to realize that I'm not going to be email, I'm not going to be replying within the hour. I'm going to need to check with him. Is that okay? 
what happens if he does need me within the hour? How does he let me know? Perhaps he sends a message to my phone, right? And I'll do it and make an agreement with you, you know, Mr. CEO, that if you send me a message, it will beep on the phone and I'll get right back to you. Send me an email, I'll process it and I'll do it, you know, or you'll get a reply by the end of the week. And that, will, and, and that will help me, Mr. CEO, to work on these big projects that I'm trying to work on, which you want me to do. Is that, oh, do we have a deal? Yes, absolutely. Okay, and so forth. And then you start to renegotiate with other stakeholders. Perhaps you put a message on your signature saying, you know, from now on, um, I'm only going to be, you know, from now on, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very busy period, lots of key projects. So don't be surprised if it takes me a couple of days to reply to your email. So you can do that kind of thing. You're renegotiating agreements. Uh, an email is, is much more than email. It's meetings, it's projects, right. it's tasks. But, but you have to have those conversations where you influence, you persuade, and you lead in order to free up your time. Yeah, I think that's a really important concept because let's face it, if you know, if you're always, you know, have have your eye on your inbox and you get a, you know, you get an email from one of the executives that you feel like you have to respond to immediately, if you were in the flow of your strategic planning and you stop to go and respond to this email, it's you're not going to get back into the flow of what you were working on for probably an hour. Yeah. So it's not just the time that it takes you to write the email. It's the time that it takes you to get your mindset back into right. the strategic thinking that you were doing. Right. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's why, for example, I'll take it. You know, Monday is my focus day. You know, I, I don't do calls on Mondays. I don't do client work on Mondays. It's my deep work day. So I can be in the zone and not have to worry about emails and messages. So I suppose, Peter, what I was wanted to say is these four shifts, stop trying to free up time, examining your beliefs first, focusing on acceleration and not speed, and working the room and renegotiating these agreements. You know, these are some of the shifts that you need to make to actually do things like beat the Zoom fatigue, free up time for more strategic work. You know, you can't, you know, if you want to beat Zoom fatigue, you need to basically get off Zoom, right? Um, <laughs> You need to find what do I need to do instead of being on Zoom. What would be more valuable? You need to think about what's driving me to be on all these meetings. Why do I feel the need to be on so many meetings? Right? You need to think about well, these meetings are occurring. How do I? What do I need to build? What system or process do I need to eliminate the need for me to be on these meetings so much? Right? Is it, well, how else would I do this? And then, okay, well, there are some meetings that I need to extract myself from. How am I going to convince those other people that I don't need to be in, the, in, that, in their meeting? <laughs> um, how do I persuade them um, to send me a little summary of the main decisions rather than me having to sit on an hour's call to learn that for myself? Right. So these are the four shifts in practice. That sort of reminds me, you know, be sitting in meetings that you don't need to be in being copied on an email that you don't need to be copied on. They're mm. basically the same concept, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's, um, yeah. Or, um, 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 yeah. Or being asked by your team for things which they can decide themselves. Right. right Again, right. It's, it's this process. You need to build a little way to help your team to not bring you those tasks and for them to figure out the answer themselves. Again, I work with that on my clients, various techniques you can use, but as these things stack up, you start to create this, this extra bit of time, which you then reinvest, which creates even more time in the future, which you can reinvest. And that's why some executives, they're always overloaded and they're kind of treading water. Mm -hmm. But actually the most impactful ones they have to, they have margin. <laughs> they're not the most stressed out people, uh, and yet they're creating the results. Right. Well, Richard, I really appreciate our time today. This has been a fascinating conversation. Are there any resources you can share with uh, with the audience to help them understand and get more involved in these four shifts that you explained today? Yeah, probably the, the, the best one is, um, there's a couple I can think of. So the first one is I have a podcast. Um, 
uh, called the Impact Multiplier CEO. Um, and to do two things on that. We I speak with other kind of high-level CEOs um, around their own success formula and how, how they create impact. And they also share some of my own thoughts and ideas uh, on some of these topics that we've been talking about. Um, and you can find that at xquadrant.com uh, slash podcast, or you can find it on your favorite um, podcast app. So that's the Impact Multiplier CEO. And then if you're interested in this topic on productivity, have a, a free course, um, which is called uh, Freeing Yourself Up, for strategic activity, uh, subtitled an executive's productivity paradigm. So this is really a course, it's about eight or so emails um, that kind of take you through some of these mindset shifts mm -hmm. and some of these ways of thinking uh, about your role as a leader and how you can free up this time for more strategic things. And you can go to um, xquadrant.com slash go slash productivity to find up for that, to find out about that. It's a, it's a free course. Um, there's a few other things, other resources you'll find on the website. I've got a little productivity calculator. So if you're actually interested in, um, in figuring out like, how am I doing on a scale of one to a hundred, right? When it comes to some of these issues, um, then you can get a bit of a reality check, a bit of a benchmark. Um, and, um, and you'll find that on the website as well. Awesome. Well, again, Richard, thank you very much for taking time to speak with me today here on Total Picture. You're welcome. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. Please hang on for just a minute. Like most of you, my business was completely upended by COVID-19. Instead of filming marketing, sales, testimonial, and product demo videos at conferences and corporate offices, I'm living on Zoom. Zoom can be an effective video tool for many kinds of powerful content. As people have become more comfortable being on camera and upgrading their video streaming capabilities, we are now able to create high quality, entertaining, and informative videos using the Zoom platform. Virtual meetings, customer testimonials, product demos, marketing pitches. You'll be amazed at the video quality and the amount of sophistication and graphic complexity we're able to create. For a free consultation on how you can use video to market and promote your business, send me an email, peter at totalpicture.com and check out totalpicture.com forward slash work. I look forward to hearing from you, and thanks for tuning in.